and welcome back to Chemist Tea Time. So now that we've discussed electronic and molecular structures, let's tie it in with some concepts we've discussed before and talk about polarity. Back when we discussed electronegativity, we learned that bonds can be polar or nonpolar. Well, the same applies to molecules. Molecules can be nonpolar if they are made up of nonpolar bonds, like N2, or have symmetrical polar bonds based on molecular shape. A good example of a molecule that contains polar bonds but is nonpolar overall is CO2. The difference in electronegativity between carbon and oxygen is about 0.9, making this a polar bond. However, the carbon in CO2 has a linear molecular geometry, so we know the bonds are 180 degrees apart. This means the dipoles of each carbon double bond are in opposite directions, making the net dipole zero. Molecules with asymmetric polar bonds or lone pairs are polar. Due to the presence of asymmetric polar bonds or lone pairs, these molecules have areas of high and low electron density, leading to the formation of molecular dipoles. There are several steps to determine the polarity of a molecule. The first step is to identify the electron and molecular geometry around your central atom. This will give you an idea of the shape of the molecule as well as the direction and orientation of any bonds or lone pairs. The second step is to determine any bond dipoles and their magnitudes. You can do this by comparing the electronegativity values. It is also important to remember that electrons have a negative charge so lone pairs will have a negative dipole with the positive end pointed at the nucleus of the central atom. Once we have this information, the last step is to sum up the directions and magnitude of the individual dipoles to determine the overall molecular dipole. Let's try to determine the polarity of water using these steps. First, we need to identify the electron and molecular geometry. We can see that H2O has a tetrahedral electron geometry and a bent molecular geometry. So here we see that OH bonds are angled downward and the lone pair on top. Next, we determine the magnitude and direction of the bond dipoles. Remember to draw dipole arrows to point toward the areas with more electron density. So here, the OH bond dipoles point towards the oxygen, and there is a dipole pointed from the oxygen to each lone pair. The last step is to use the magnitude and direction of the individual dipoles to determine the overall polarity of the molecule. In this case, the sum of all the individual dipoles creates a positive dipole towards the bottom of the molecule and a negative dipole at the top by the lone pairs. Molecular polarity is important for solubility, that is whether two compounds will dissolve in each other. The rule of thumb is that like dissolves like, meaning polar molecules only dissolve in polar substances and nonpolar molecules are only soluble in nonpolar substances. This is why oil and water don't mix. Water is a polar compound while oil is made up of nonpolar hydrocarbons. Since they have different polarity, they will not dissolve in one another. The polarity of molecules also determines what intermolecular forces they experience. Intermolecular forces are the attractive force between molecules. The strength of intermolecular forces determines properties like volatility, boiling, and melting points. As the strength of intermolecular forces increases, substances tend to have higher melting and boiling points and lower volatility because the attractive forces are stronger. Intermolecular forces are broken up into several types based on the phenomenon that causes them. Molecules that have permanent dipole moments experience a stronger intermolecular force known as dipole-dipole interaction. This occurs when the negative dipole of a molecule is attracted to the positive end of another molecule. The stronger the polarity of the molecule, the stronger the attractive force becomes. Molecular dipoles can also be attracted to oppositely charged ions such as Na plus and Cl minus. This is known as an ion dipole interaction and is even stronger than dipole dipole because the ion has a permanent positive or negative charge. There is also an extreme case of dipole dipole interaction known as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding only occurs between molecules where hydrogen is bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Remember, hydrogen bonding is fun! <laughs> Since these three atoms are very small and very electronegative, their bond with hydrogen creates a large dipole moment. 
Their small size also allows the surrounding hydrogen bonding molecules to get much closer, significantly increasing the attractive force. It is crucial to remember that this is still an intermolecular force that occurs between several molecules that can hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonding is also important in that it allows water to have a relatively high boiling point relative to other small molecules. The last type of intermolecular force is known as London dispersion forces. This is the weakest intermolecular force, but it is present in all molecules and is often the only attractive force between nonpolar mo molecules. London dispersion forces are caused because electrons are always moving. This can cause random moments where one side of an atom or molecule has slightly higher electron density. Meanwhile, another part of the molecule has less electron density, so the nuclei create a partial positive charge. This is called an instantaneous dipole. This instantaneous dipole can then induce dipoles in other molecules. When this happens, the positive dipole of one molecule is briefly attracted to the negative dipole of another molecule, creating a weak, short-lived intermolecular force. Hopefully today's lesson gave you some insight into how molecular structure shapes the world around us. Join us next time when we talk about how bonds are formed. Until then, have a wonderful day and thank you for watching Chemist Tea Time. Thank you.